okay, we're, we're here in our lab. You, you no longer deserve a break. Time to get to work. So, <clears throat> let's actually try to solve differential equations now. Talk about how you get your hands dirty. How you use these algorithms in a practical case. Well, the method will still be our good old friend, the leapfrog method. And we need to decide a few things before we use it. We're going to start with some initial time, take it out far away, uh, very large time, so you can make sure the algorithm works and you see how well it works. And the two questions are, one, how do you pick the best value of H? And number two, what's the best algorithm to use? You know, what makes an algorithm good and what makes it bad? Okay. So take a look at slide three. What do you see? Ah, you see your old friends. Okay. So here's some oscillators. Mm -hmm. So we have a harmonic oscillator on the left. That corresponds to P equals 2, power 2. And we have an anharmonic oscillator on the right. And what's nice about oscillators, particularly for our problem here, is if we have no friction, we know that if we released a ball, it would just roll back and forth in the oscillator forever. If it's anharmonic oscillator, it would still roll back and forth forever. And that means that the motion must be periodic. Periodic just means it repeats itself exactly in time, always being the same each time. Harmonic motion is one special case of that. The re real world is full of periodic motion, most of which is not harmonic. Okay. So, we are solving again for some force. The force is derived from a potential. Potential is just proportional to the position from the rest position, x, to some power p. We keep the power p even just to make sure there's always a restoring force. In other words, the force always takes the ball of the mass back to the center. And as p gets larger and larger, the motion becomes less and less harmonic. In other words, more anharmonic. We'll start with the harmonic oscillator, p equals 2. And the reason is we know the analytic, we know the exact answer. The computer, however, doesn't know the exact answer. So if we develop a computer method we, and you learn how to use the computer tools well enough so that you can reproduce the analytic answer very well, and the computer never knew what the analytic answer was, then for other values of p than 2 for which there are no analytic solutions, we can be confident in the computer solution, at least if you're careful and you learn how to apply the algorithm. So that's what we're trying to do. First we start off with a case we know well, we learn how to use the algorithm, we learn how to judge whether it's good, then we move ahead to cases whose solution are unknown. Okay. So what's the, what's the known answer here? Well the known answer for the harmonic oscillator is just the usual position is a periodic function of time. Periodic here being sinusoidal, sinusoidal meaning either sine or cosine or both. So here I write the solution as A amplitude times sine of omega zero t plus phi. The phi is a phase and it just means depending on the initial conditions you could have sine, you can have cosine, so you usually want to be careful, set it up so that you either have the mass at rest released initially, then it has some amplitude A, or the case I actually prefer is start the mass at the origin with some initial velocity, and then it'll just be cosine type of motion, uh, <clears throat> and then we can have various energies built in as well. Omega zero is just the natural frequency of the system. The important part here for us is that omega zero is related to the period, T. So whereas the physics and the math is easiest when you look at the frequency, your computer solution will have times, and t is the natural uh, unit for that. And t is just related to the constants and the parameters in the problem, k being the spring constant, m being the mass. Okay. So what are the general rules of thumb here? Well, if we're solving this problem on the computer, remember we're building a castle on a foundation of sand you must always be careful not to propagate forward errors otherwise your foundation crumbles below you. Always use double precision. There's no reason for this calculation, in fact for any scientific calculation, to use single precision. Unless you're just counting numbers and the numbers don't get too large, use double. The derivative function f, that's all you input, that's your method, 
That's what gets called by the algorithm. You don't have to change the algorithm to speak of. You should be smart, okay? Choose values of k and m so that here in the equation for omega, omega zero, so that you have simple constants to work with. I recommend choose a k and an m so that the period t is one. Then you know 100 periods means time of 100. Some other students choose k and m equal to one, in which case the period is two pi. Nothing wrong with that. That works well. Okay. How do you start? Well, if you remember my rule of thumb, it says you, you probably want at least 100 time steps. Uh, time steps, about at least 100 time steps in a typical interval. A typical interval here would be the period. So don't start there. What you always want to do with an algorithm is start where it's bad and see it get better. And then you know it's working, it's converging, watch it get better. And in this case, try making h so small that it stops getting better, at which point you know, aha, round off error has come in. So start with h small, but not that small, about a fifth of a period. And then you should get bad answers. It's nice to see bad answers and then make them better and keep making h small until it gets better. Then look at your solution. First, you look at it qualitatively. Because if you're not right qualitatively, don't waste your time with the quantitative answers. It's wrong. You can always tell if it's wrong qualitatively. It doesn't mean it's right, but you can tell if it's wrong. What does qualitative mean? It means your solution, your y of t, should be smooth. Physical objects are by and large smooth. Here for this problem, where it's just oscillations inside of a well, it has to be smooth. There shouldn't be any kinks. There shouldn't be any sore teeth. It has to be smooth. Furthermore, the period T must be constant. There's no friction, no way energy can get lost. The period can't change. It should always look the same. Also, if you plot the analytic and the numerical solution on the same graph, it should look the same. You're probably thinking, exactly the same? It better look exactly the same. Because you, how many places can you see on the graph? You can see 1.3, fine. Maybe 1.35, different from 1.36, no. So you're only looking at two, at best, three decimal places. These methods should be good to 11, 12, 15 decimal places. You should see no difference. Okay. So don't come up to me or your instructor and show a graph where the two differ. Then you know it's not right. Keep making h smaller until they agree. You should also see for real life that simple harmonic motion is isochronous. What? What do you say? Isochronous. That, don't you use that word all the time? Isochronous means that the period is independent of the amplitude. That's true for one case only in nature, and that's harmonic motion. Okay? And that's, you should verify that. And we'll see that on the next slide. So let's look now at slide four, where we have a much better assessment. Energy conservation. How do we use energy conservation? Well, have we built energy conservation into the solution any place? No, I mean, Runga Kutta, Runga and Kutta, neither of them knew about energy conservation. They were mathematicians, right? So they just tell you how to solve that differential equation. Does the differential equation solve energy? And the answer is, no, the differential equation doesn't involve energy at all. In fact, it never has, looks at it, never requires it to be constant, okay? But we know if there's no friction, then energy must be a constant of the motion, or an integral of the motion, as it's called. It's not built into the solution explicitly, but it's built into the theory. So if it's Newton's second law, which if you can recall back to the previous lecture, we started with F equals ma, Newton's law with no uh, frictional forces always gives you energy conservation. Likewise, it comes from the dynamical form of the equations. You can prove it. That's a constant of motion but it has nothing to do with the algorithm. So it's a good test. Does it depend on whether it's a harmonic oscillator or a non-harmonic oscillator? Nope, doesn't matter. It's a good, good exam question always. Energy conservation is independent of that. It doesn't require harmonic motion. So for us, it'll be a demanding test of the solution. You should look at hundreds or thousands of cycles and still see the energy not changing. Or see how much it changes. Better yet, 
a good algorithm, a good computing person, a good computational scientist doesn't have perfect algorithms, but they're in control. They know when the air is getting big, when it's not, what it should look like. That's what we're aiming for. So there it comes up. Okay. So what we want you to do is to make a plot. Plot the potential energy, plot the kinetic energy, and plot the total energy as a function of time. And look at them. You never, never underestimate the importance in computation of printing out results and looking at them, particularly looking at them. So how do you plot the potential energy? Well, that's easy. You know what the potential is. It could be any crazy potential that's input. So you just plot it for various values of x as a function of time. So your solution gives you x as a function of time. Y superscript 0 is just x. You just plot up the potential energy as a function of time. <clears throat> Likewise, your solution gives you the velocity, y superscript 1, as a function of time. You just plot up 1 half mv squared. That's always the kinetic energy, regardless of what the potential is. And then you add the two together. The two kinetic plus potential should give you the total energy. If energy is a constant of the motion, you should get an answer which is independent of time. That's hard to do with real precision, but it should be true. So what you should see here always, if you plot kinetic and potential energy, you should plot, you should see a plot that in which the kinetic and the potential energy are correlated. In other words, when the kinetic energy is big, potential energy has to be small because the sum can't change. And when potential gets big, kinetic has to be small. So they go back and forth, opposite phase. That's what you have to see. Okay? How do we develop a metric for this? How do we tell if energy is really constant? How do we tell how good our solution is? Well, the metric I recommend is to say, let's look at the initial energy of the system as a function of time. We call that E at time zero. Then we calculate up to some time, 10, 100 periods, whatever. Uh, we look at the energy as a function of time, and we subtract the two. And if the two are very close, we should get a small number, right? If energy is conserved, we should get zero. Nothing's perfect on the computer that way. You won't get a perfect zero. But if we divide it by the initial energy, which we know, so E zero is just the initial conditions, or determined from the initial conditions, This number here is just the relative error in the energy. Very good. So we take the relative er error in the energy, we take its logarithm to base 10, not E, not the natural log, with base 10. And then we say, well, let's say the relative error was 10 to the minus eighth of the initial energy. So when we take the division here, we're left with 10 to the minus eighth. The log of 10 to the minus eighth is just minus eighth. So the logarithm of the relative error gives us with a minus sign, the number of decimal places in the solution. I was repeat that. We just take the logarithm base 10 of the relative error, which we know when we have an analytic solution, or we talked about how to estimate this uh, even when you didn't know the analytic, but let's assume here it's the analytic. That gives you the number of decimal places in the solution, just like that. So if we make a graph, and here's a real live graph made by a real live student. Well, it was real live when he made it. I don't know what it is now. And of the relative error as a function of time. And what you see here is the error, log to the base 10, function of time, and how many steps were made in the solution. You can put the step size. This is using a relatively small number of steps. Remember our rule of thumb, about 100 per interval. Here he used 500 for the interval, and it was pretty good. He got better than nine places of precision. But when he pushed it to 1,000 steps, he was already getting 10, 12 places. He, with 5,000, was getting essentially 13 or 14. And what's fascinating here, and after all of my shtick about castles built on sand, you see that something good is happening to us. Not often that good things happen to you without you working at it, but you see that the error tends to oscillate and it gets not just growing bigger in time, it gets it goes through zeros. So it oscillates, gets smaller, gets bigger, oscillates, it gets smaller again. So there's cancellations occurring in this errors between the different terms and it doesn't keep growing, it gets better. 
or it stays that way. There might be a slight drift upward here. You could see that's what you need to look for. But you'll have to go out hundreds. That's for you to see. I won't tell, tell you. You don't, maybe we better say that. Okay. So that was sort of the qualitative analysis and a bit of a quantitative analysis using energy conservation to tell you how many places of precision. And that's how you know if you're ever on an oral exam and some, some committee member who's, who doesn't understand a thing you've done asks you, how good is your solution? How many places of precision? This is how you answer it. You say, well, one doesn't know unless you know the analytic answer, but for my test cases, I could get 13, 15 places without any trouble. Then he'll be quiet for a while. Okay. So what we want you to do in the laboratory now is to go solve the simple harmonic motion, solve the linear oscillator, and choose H values until you can get 11 to 15 places of precision. So let me put it a better way. Choose H values so that you get 11 places of precision, and then see how many more places of precision you can milk this algorithm out for. You should be able to get better than that, and then if you make H smaller still, it should get worse. That means round of errors accumulating too, too big. Then, particularly uh, for the full analysis, you should fill out a table. And what's the table? Well, here's the table. We want you to compare RK2 and RK4, our second order and fourth order runga cutter. You can do Euler as well, but Euler is not as good, and you know, why waste your time with the easy marshmallows? And as optional, that's why it's in parentheses here, you can try RK4-5. Now, we haven't spoken about RK4-5 here in any, any detail. It's essentially an RK4 algorithm in which the algorithm automatically changes, halves the step size, and see if the answer gets better. And if it doesn't get better, it makes the step size bigger. So it just changes the step size automatically to get the best possible precision. In our experience, and particularly with the RK4-5 we've written, uh, you can get better precision, but you pay a price. It takes longer. Okay, so it's not a freebie. In theory, it could save you time by letting you use bigger step sizes, but not for the problems we've looked at. So we want you, anyway, compare mainly RK2 and RK4. See to get a certain error. And you can choose the error. One way to do it is to say, I want at least 11 places. For, to get that error, see what H values you need. See how many floating point operations you need. Okay? And then see, time your solution, see how much longer it takes. So this tells you a few things. It should tell you, you might be able to get the same error, the same precision, with a poor algorithm by using more time, by using more steps, making more steps. Uh, floating point operations and time are not necessarily the same. The calculation can be spending time other places than just adding and subtracting. So it's, they should be proportional. You should see that. Okay? Uh, and then, then you have a, a real handle on the method. Next, we want you to uh, look also at a nonlinear oscillator and compare the motions for a nonlinear oscillator with motions for a linear oscillator. And what you should see here, this is a, a detailed analysis, it's a fascinating one, is that as the value of P is large, the particle, when it moves around inside of this well, is essentially free in the middle. So it's spending most of its time being free, and only when it bounces off the edge does it feel much kinetic energy. Okay? So you should get a very different shape as an answer. And all you have to do is plug it in, just change the value of P, the algorithm should stay pretty much the same. You may need to make the algorithm size a little smaller because there's very large accelerations when the particle bounces off the walls. Large accelerations mean large forces. It means things can change rapidly. But if you're using a large number, it should be automatic. And then as optional, the statement about the particle being nearly free is in mechanics, dynamics textbooks, given as the virial theorem. And the virial theorem says that on the average, average over time. And you can do that for one period here. The average kinetic energy is the power P of the potential divided by 2 times the potential. So when the P gets higher, like P equals 6, 
the uh, kinetic energy, let's say average might be the same, so the average potential energy has to get smaller, which is right. Potential energy is nearly zero most of the time. So check out the virial field. You'll see it as an arcane theorem in mechanics books, but on the computer, it should make sense now. Okay. So I already indicated on the last transparency, number five, as we do here on slide six. So on slide six, which is just a review, we want you to look at a nonlinear oscillator. Okay. So here we're telling you again how to do that. So this is all a review. We've given you the potential. It's a power x to p. We know the force. Just put this in as a new force. We're just solving equation five in Newton's law. So that's a review. Okay. What should you get? Well, we want you to vary the powers of p now, say between two, whose answer you know, all the way up to 12. 12 would be very interesting. And you should change the h value a little bit. You should have to make it smaller as p gets larger, because the larger accelerations. Okay? But it, it won't be a big effect. Then, for any one p value, keep the power constant and vary the initial conditions. And what should you see? Well, first you should see that the period t is constant. So if you look at the graph here, this is a graph of several motions, you should see that you look along the top here, the amplitude is constant, there's no friction. This is not simple harmonic motion, but you see the amplitude stays constant and the period, the time between the bumps, stays constant. That's good. That's what you should see. Okay? And then <clears throat> if you look at the period, the time between the bumps, it's also constant. And now we should look at the effect of initial conditions. Now this gets interesting. So now if we change the initial conditions, what will we see? We should still always see that, you can't see both here, at x equals zero, or whenever the particle goes through x equals zero, that should correspond to the maximum velocity. You should see that. And likewise, the uh, minimum velocity should always occur at the largest x value. Okay, so at the extremity of the motion. If you vary the initial conditions, you should see some interesting anharmonic shapes. And I want you to explain that based on what we sp spoke about the shape of the well. In particular, what you'll see here is you no longer have, uh, you no longer have motion w in which the period is independent of the amplitude. So here we have an odd power of p, which we fix up to make a restoring force, and we see that if we have a larger initial amplitude, then the particle has a smaller period, it oscillates more quickly. So this is no longer isochronous motion. If we have a smaller period here, we see a, if we have a smaller amplitude, we see a slower oscillation. Okay? And that's typical of non-harmonic oscillations. So you should see effects like this in your solution. If you've never studied anything like this, that's wonderful. Now you're using the power of the computer to learn something new. So, I think we've probably told you enough of what to do. You should get to work. Try these things out, see if you can learn something new, and then come back next time, tell me what you've learned.